I first became truly aware of the atrocities of the 20th century when I started watching the theist-anti-theist debates that became popular here on YouTube about 15 years ago. I had heard about how certain regimes had committed great crimes against humanity when I was in high school, but I really didn't appreciate the scale of what had happened until I discovered these debates. The theists would typically argue that the millions who died in Stalinist Russia, Mao's China, the Khmer Rouge, North Korea, etc., were a result of these societies abandoning religion in favor of Marxism, an atheistic ideology. The anti-theist side would typically argue that the atheism of these despots was incidental to their slaughter. At the time, it seemed like everyone wanted to own the principles of Western civilization. These principles included individual liberty, representative government, civil liberties, a robust civil society, market economies, science, rights for women and minorities, and so on. At the time, I considered myself on the left. I watched people like Cenk Uger and Sam Cedar unironically to get my news and commentary. I also considered myself a capitalist, as did most other people on the left at the time. For example, here's an Amazing Atheist video from 2013. And I'm not anti-capitalist. Hell, later on in this video, I'm going to try to sell you my book. I'm not against capitalism. I'm not against rewarding people who work harder or smarter than the rest of us. That's fine with me. But should the system really be this unequal? Should there really be this level of disparity? Capitalism wasn't inherently bad. In fact, it worked pretty well as long as there are robust regulations in place, a generous welfare state to help those who had fallen on hard times, and perhaps the government provision of some essential things like health insurance. The left believed this, and the right believed in a freer, more scaled-down version of essentially the same thing. I thought that we all knew that the 20th century had proven that socialism was a bankrupt ideology, and that mixed economies were the secret to economic prosperity. When Republicans would fearmonger about Barack Obama, they'd call him a socialist. The left would respond that he wasn't, and there were no qualifications or caveats afterwards about how it would be a good thing if he was, though. For all of the hyperbolic rhetoric that there was, the actual confines of the policy debate were relegated to a pretty narrow spectrum. Over time, the left started to become more and more progressive. This was especially obvious during the Occupy Wall Street movement, and even more so during Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign. By this time, my own politics had changed significantly to something much closer to what they are now, so I was very much apart from all of this. Had I not changed, I still probably would have been welcome on the left as late as 2016. Today, that would no longer be the case. I'd be decried as a dirty neoliberal, which would make me just about as bad as a fascist. I don't know at what point the left became viciously anti-capitalist and pro-socialist to the point where some of them even started to apologize for the brutal socialist dictators of the 20th century, but I remember the moment I personally realized it. I was watching a secular talk video in August of 2017. Kyle played a clip of Sean Hannity arguing that then-president Donald Trump could get unemployment down to zero. You don't actually want 0% unemployment, by the way, but that's neither here nor there. For whatever reason, I decided to scroll down into the comments section, and I saw this question from an account called Pride Tunes, aka Afro Lion. They asked, will Trump eliminate unemployment like Joseph Stalin did? This question currently has 291 likes. I have no recollection of how many it had at the time, but given that it was one of the first comments I saw, it was probably up there. At first, I didn't know if this dude was joking. As in, was he facetiously asking, is Donald Trump going to kill millions of people to get that unemployment rate down? So I decided to look at the replies, and sure enough, he and others were defending Stalin. When people brought up body counts, he demanded a source and would dismiss any evidence they brought forward. This guy is what we call a selective skeptic. He will scrutinize your sources down to the gnat's ass, all the while expecting you to take his at face value. Selective skeptics are some of the most annoying people to argue with online or in real life but I digress. At the time, I was genuinely shocked to see a tanky in the comments section with such approval, but there it was. I was probably late to the game, but after this, I started to notice more and more people online identifying as socialists and about how more dramatic measures needed to be taken to solve societal ills. There are now more independent leftist content creators than there ever have been, and they're becoming increasingly popular. Jank Uger and Sam Cedar are now the moderates of the online left, or sellouts, depending on who you ask. People like Vosh, Richard Wolff, Hassan Piker, and other self-identified socialists are becoming increasingly
increasingly influential. Now, it's one thing for some anonymous dude in the comments section to praise Joseph Stalin. But what do these more intellectual types have to say about the 20th century socialism? Well, there's not one answer to that. In fairness, most of them keep their distance. They usually don't engage in outright denialism. At least, not that I've seen. Though they do seem to try and have things both ways. They love to attribute the supposed successes of these regimes to their ideology. Like when Richard Wolff gloats about the economic growth of Stalinist Russia and 1990s China. In the 20th century, the fastest growing metric, the fastest growing GDP in any country measured was the Soviet Union. And in the 21st century we're living in, the fastest growing GDP in the world has been the People's Republic of China. But they don't want to own the downsides. You see, when it comes to the crimes against humanity, these guys swear up and down that it is not an outgrowth of the socialism of these regimes. You see, these regimes were authoritarian, and authoritarianism is not socialism. Socialism is democratic by definition. In the original sense, the word democratic socialism is uh, is redundant. It's like saying wet water. Uh, but of course, because of uh, the aftermath of the Russian Revolution and the rise of that kind of communism with the capital C that was very authoritarian, uh, now you have to say, you know, democratic socialism to, uh, to differentiate it from that. As Nathan J. Robinson writes in his book, Why You Should Be a Socialist, at the core of economic democracy is the notion that control should not be vested in a small group of people, but in the people who do the labor. Managers and owners shouldn't decide what the workers have to do. The workers should decide what managers have to do or if they need managers at all. And they should own the workplaces themselves. Here we can see why the authoritarian so-called socialist regimes of the 20th century did not deserve to be called socialist at all. In the Soviet Union, workers had very limited control over their workplaces. They were told what to do by party functionaries. Socialism does not mean control by the government. It means control by the people. And if the government is not responsive to the will of the people, it's socialistic in the same way that Kim Jong-un's Democratic People's Republic of Korea is democratic. This is also why, while I and many others use the term democratic socialism to draw a distinction between our ideas and the hideous so-called socialism implemented under Joseph Stalin, ultimately the term should be redundant. Socialism is a term for economic democracy, so an undemocratic system doesn't deserve to claim the name. The online left doesn't want the world to embrace dictatorships like Stalinist Russia, or Castro's Cuba, or even Chavez's Venezuela. No, if anything, they want to scale back authoritarianism by eliminating tyrannies in the workplace by introducing democracy into that space. They want more freedom and less tyranny. Now, how they go about implementing these changes, they're never really clear about. And here's where they start to run into problems. You see, most capitalists I know, myself included, are not inherently opposed to worker-run cooperatives. And if you want to start your own co-op where the workers own the means of production and they build the materials and you're willing to compete with me who start a company in a, call it, traditional way, then fine, I'm, I, I'm happily compete. Uh, with uh, have that competition. I know exactly how it will turn out. I've, I, I come from a, a you know, I, I know how the kibbutzim have turned out, which were voluntary uh, co-ops like that. They, they were economic disasters from day one. I know how all the communes and co-ops in history Hold on. have worked so, out. They may be misguided, but if people want to make one, they have the right to do so in a free society. Whether they know it or not, whether they appreciate it or not, the socialists cannot reciprocate. Left to themselves, they will not allow capitalist enterprises to exist because they view them as inherently exploitative. As Robert Nozick put it, socialists must forbid capitalist acts between consenting adults. This is why these socialist dictatorships necessarily turn towards violence. They could not allow people to be free because people would necessarily associate in ways they don't approve of. Lance from the Serfs says he doesn't want to use violence to advance his agenda of democratizing capitalist workplaces. In terms of what percentage should be, I am advocating for all, every, every single job to be worker controlled. Every, against the will of the people, let's say, let's say there's a part of the economy that tells you we want to stay capitalistic, our workers are perfectly fine with this, 
you would object to discontinuing it to exist? I'm not forcing it upon anyone, though. I'm not, I'm not saying that this has to come down from the government on high or that there has to be some kind of Stalinistic regime that forces people to do things against their will. I'm saying that this is what I'm advocating for. Whether or not people choose to do this is something that I hope that I can spread by telling this message to more people. He reminds me of what one famous socialist said in 1921. There are two methods, the method of coercion, the military method, and the method of persuasion, the trade union method. The mistake Trotsky makes is that he underrates the difference between the army and the working class. He tries to transfer military methods from the army into the working class. The Soviet power can only be directed through the medium of the working class and with the forces of the working class. Obviously, it is impossible to do this by coercive methods. Obviously, only proletarian democracy, only methods of persuasion can make it possible to unite the working class to stimulate its independent activity. That quotation was from Joseph Stalin. These socialist regimes that the online left decries as bastardizations of Marxist theory initially sold themselves as projects in the grand expansion of democracy. For example, the Soviets in the Soviet Union were democratically elected workers' councils based around some unit of economic production, like a factory. Hence, a Soviet republic was supposed to be a semi-direct grassroots democracy for which these local workers' councils were to be the backbone. It's not just that these regimes advertise themselves as democratic initially. Many influential Western leftist intellectuals talked about them this way as well. Pilgrimages to these new workers' paradises were frequent among influential leftists back in the day, and more often than not, they came back with glowing praise. It's only in retrospect, after these regimes have exposed themselves as economic and political basket cases, that leftists say they weren't real experiments in socialism. As Christian Nimitz writes in Socialism, the failed idea that never dies, the apologetics for, then later retrospective denunciation of these regimes, follows a specific cycle. This book will show that as long as a socialist experiment is in its prime, its socialist credentials are rarely in doubt. As long as socialism seems to work, it is always real socialism. It is only when it fails and when it becomes an embarrassment for the socialist cause that it is retroactively recategorized as unreal. This book will show that virtually all socialist experiments in history, including and in fact, especially the Soviet Union and Maoist China, were, at some point or other, widely endorsed by prominent Western intellectuals. They were all held up as real socialism until they ceased to be real socialism and retroactively became unreal socialism. More precisely, this book will show that in terms of their reception in Western countries, socialist experiments usually go through three distinct phases. One, the honeymoon period. The first stage is a honeymoon period, during which the experiment has, or at least seems to have, some initial success in some areas. During this period, its international standing is relatively high. Even anti-socialists concede, grudgingly, that the country in question has something to show for it. During the honeymoon period, very few dispute the experiment's socialist character. Almost nobody claims that the country is not really socialist. On the contrary, during the honeymoon period, large numbers of Western intellectuals enthusiastically embrace the experiment. Self-declared socialists claim ownership of it and parade it as an example of their ideas in action. Two, the excuses and what about a period? But the honeymoon period never lasts forever. The country's luck either comes to an end, or its already existing failures become more widely known in the West. As a result, its international standing deteriorates. It ceases to be an example that socialists hold against their opponents, and becomes an example that their opponents hold against them. During this period, Western intellectuals still support the experiment, but their tone becomes angry and defensive. The focus changes from the experiment's supposed achievements to the supposed ulterior motives of its critics. There's a frantic search for excuses, with the blame usually placed on imaginary saboteurs and unspecified attempts to undermine it. There is plenty of whataboutery. 3. The not-real socialism stage. Eventually, there always comes a point when the experiment has been widely discredited and is seen as a failure by most of the general public. The experiment becomes a liability for the socialist cause, 
and an embarrassment for Western socialists. This is the stage when intellectuals begin to dispute the experiment's socialist credentials, and, crucially, they do so with retroactive effect. They argue that the country was never socialist in the first place, and that its leaders never even tried to implement socialism. This is the deeper meaning behind the old adage that real socialism has never been tried. Socialism gets retroactively redefined as unreal whenever it fails. So it has never been tried in the same way in which, in Orwell's 1984, the government of Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Modern socialists say they want to expand democracy. That's exactly what socialists back in the day said as well. This is exactly what they tried to do, and we see the results they got. Nimitz shows how contemporaneous leftist intellectuals initially praised Stalinist Russia, Maoist China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, and a number of other disreputable regimes as great experiments in democratization, only to denounce them later as not being truly socialist. Here are some of my favorite quotations from contemporaneous leftist intellectuals that Nimitz cites praising Stalinist Russia. Joseph Freeman, a writer, magazine editor, and member of the USA Communist Party, said that in Russia, everyone acted as though the general good was his personal good, as though his personal difficulties could be solved by conquering the common difficulties. In America, the worker has no real voice in the management of the national economy. Here, the average man felt himself master of everything. Waldo Frank, an American historian, novelist, and literary critic, said of Soviet factories, Here are happy workers, because they are whole men and women. Dream, thought, love, collaborate, and the tedious business of making electronic parts. Since these toilers are not working for a boss, not even for a living. When I hear Richard Wolff say stuff like this, For them, what socialism means is the transformation of the everyday life of working people. No longer do you go to work with other people telling you what to do, where to sit, what machine to use, what raw material to work on. And at the end of the day, you go home and you've got nothing more to say about what you poured your brains and muscles into. No, no, no. For these socialists, like me, the crucial thing is to reorganize the workplace, to bring real democracy, can you believe it, to the place where we work. In a country that claims to be democratic, we don't have democracy in the workplace. We have a tiny group of people telling the majority what to do, fully unaccountable to that majority. I feel like you'd be right at home with these two. The book goes on like this for each regime. If you're interested in war, I highly suggest you read it for yourself. And I'm sure that I'll be talking about it more in the future. Needless to say, there were prominent leftists who criticized these regimes. George Orwell, most famous among them. But effusive praise was not some marginal position on the left. I'll close by saying one thing in favor of this new brand of online socialists. At least they're slightly more honest than a lot of other online leftists. I'm specifically thinking of the morons who think that Bernie Sanders just wants America to be like Denmark. Sometimes, even these democratic socialists even show their hand when it comes to their thoughts on using violence to implement their ideology. Uh, Chinese land reform movement <laughs> was, a cam was a campaign by the Communist Party leader Mao Zedong during the late phase of the Chinese Civil War in the early People's Republic of China. The campaign involved mass murder of landlords by tenants and land redistribution by the peasantry. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know how, I don't the estimated this. amount of casualties of the movement ranges from hundreds of thousands to millions. In terms of the Communist Party's uh, valuation, Zhao Enlai estimated 830,000 men killed by Mao Zedong, estimated as many as 3 million were killed. Um, hmm. Interesting. Cla class aside, huh? Okay. Mass mm. killings. Da, 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 da. Oh, hmm. Doodly do. Isn't history. Interesting. Mass killings of landlords. Initial campaign. How did the landlord purge? Hmm. Shortly after the founding. Oh, Lurch finally left Mao Zedong laying down new guidelines for not correcting excessive... Pre oh, this is weird stuff. I don't... I was... Uh, huh. Retaliation by landlords. Oh, oh, oops. Oh, well, I guess you can do what you want, but... More of us than our new, I don't know. These people are just ahead of the curve. Should they get any real power, we will likely see a rerun of the 20th century socialist regimes. Hopefully, we don't have to relearn those dark lessons. <laughs>